Today is May 9th, 2012, and my name is Sue Paul. I am at the Warhawk Air Museum in uh, Nampa, Idaho, conducting a Veterans History Project interview in conjunction with the Library of Congress. Today I will be interviewing Joan Clark. Joan, welcome to the Warhawk. Thank you. It is an absolute nice honor to, to have you here and preserve your history. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm glad to share it. Also uh, present in the room is Don Carson, who will be doing the filming uh, for this interview. Joan, could you please state your full name? Joan Simons Clark. And could you tell us the town that you live in, where you live? I live in Eagle, Idaho now. And could you give us your birth date and where you were born? Yes, I was born the 17th of February, 1931, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, home of the Packers. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. You're proud of that one. And would you tell us, please, the branch of the service that you served in, the years that you served, and which war uh, you served under? I served from 1950 to 1960 uh, during the Korean War, and I... Which, d which branch? It was in the Air Force, the United States Air Force. It wasn't the Air Corps anymore. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. So you were born in 1931 in the land of the Packards, is that right? That's right. All right. Could, did you grow up there? Green no, uh, when I was about six months old, my father was moved to northern Wisconsin. He was originally from northern Michigan, and the Lake Superior District Power Company took over those northern areas, and my dad uh, was in charge of merchandising for that power company. And so where, where did you grow up? I actually grew up in Ashland, Wisconsin, on the shores of Shawamigan Bay. Okay. And did you have brothers and sisters? I have a brother who's four years younger. He's a retired army officer. Okay. Did your mom work? Uh, she did when we were uh, in high school. Mm -hmm. And you went all through school then? Yes. Uh, there. And what were your interests? What uh, did you... Well, I was horse crazy as a kid and mm -hmm. animal crazy. So I, I had dogs and horses. We lived in the country. I was able to have them. And then I went into nursing at the University of Minnesota in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh -huh. Now you were uh, ten years old when the world when World War Two broke Almost out. Almost eleven, yes. Tell what do you have? Do you recall December seventh, nineteen forty one? Very where you vividly. Were? Would you tell us about that? Yes, uh, I used to go to the Saturday afternoon movies, and there was always a newsreel, and it showed what was happening in London with the buzz bombs and things like that. Mm. And I was very aware of it and very frightened because we had a Dupont plant and paper mill and iron works and so on in my town. My mother was an air raid warden, mm. and my dad was uh, working as a federal marshal for the government. He was too old for one war and too young for the other one, so that's what he did. And I remember it because a lot of my cousins and, and half the neighborhood was taken away. I, I remember always walking to school and seeing the flags hanging in the windows with the blue stars, the gold stars, and the silver stars. Mm -hmm made an impression on me. The rationing, so. do you remember the rationing? Did you have Well, I remember that? that very well, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We, and defense stamps saved all our, our money, mm -hmm. and victory gardens, uh, mm -hmm. planting seeds, growing lettuce and radishes mm -hmm. for my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother taught uh, how to preserve food for the city. Everybody was involved. Kids saved tin cans, string, uh, foil, because there was a shortage of it. Mm -hmm. I remember I was a voracious reader as a child, and I remember when nylon was invented and they made parachutes out of it because they couldn't get silk from Indochina anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a very, very strong memory. Yeah. Yes, I remember it vividly. Yeah. So you were, and so you were, uh, uh, let's see, you would have been almost 15 when the war ended then. Yes. Do you remember when the war ended? Yes, I was. The jubilation of the country, do you remember that? Well, uh, people started coming home and new jobs blossomed because people uh, who made tanks were now making tractors and those things could not be bought. People had money, but they couldn't spend it on anything. Uh, artificial rubber had been designed during the war and, and many other substitutes for things we couldn't get. And suddenly there was everything available almost too much. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The GIs came back and I went to college with them and they, they really affected the grave, the grade curve. What about the GI Bill? Did you uh, They were there on the GI mm -hmm. Bill, yeah. but they were older. They had, they had a totally different outlook. Uh, they recognized 
that they probably wouldn't have gone to college, a lot of them, if it hadn't been for that. They had grown up so seriously during the war and were for so grateful they survived. And they wanted to make up for lost time. Mm -hmm. They played hard, they had money, and they dated younger girls, in which I was one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know. Sounds like it was kind of fun. Yeah, and they were <laughs> tough competition for 18 year olds mm -hmm. that had oh, been yeah. classmates. Yeah. But yeah. they played hard, they studied hard, and you, you couldn't fool them very much. They were pretty realistic. Mm -hmm. And what was your major in college? What was your interest? I'd gone into medicine and nursing. To be a nurse. What, what made you decide uh, in 1950 to join the military? Well, uh, at that time, the subject of psychology was either considered voodoo or you believed in it. And I believed in it. And so the university offered an interest aptitude test, and so I volunteered myself for that. And I can still hear the guy a week later, is it really true that you're in the medical field? I said, yes. He said, well, nursing is the one thing you shouldn't be doing. And I said, I was suspicious of that, because <laughs> that's why I volunteered for this. I said, what, what does the test show? He says, you can do anything but that. He said, you're a jack of all trades. That's your problem. You can't make up your mind. You're too interested in too many things which has always been a problem for me. Mm. And so you, uh, why the military? Why did you decide to Well, my in? father had quit his job and opened a store, and I had a young brother coming along, and uh, economic times were coming down the road. I could see that. I, I felt like a peg, a square peg in a round hole, you know. I, I didn't know what I wanted. I wanted too many things, and I knew I wanted to see the world. And, of course, I was at the end of the line up on Lake Superior, and I needed to get into the world to see it because I knew about it. And so I thought I need something that will educate me, that will take care of me, that will pay me. And the, the Air Force looked like a good thing. It had come into being in, in 1947, and this was 1950, and the female arm of it, the WAF as they were called, came in in 1948. So everybody that I met going into the service at all come from prior service. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was it like, uh, a woman in 1950 joining the Air Force? Well, uh, you know, in the Air Force we were pretty well accepted by the others in the Air Force because they were their attitude toward differences is because of air crews. You know, the formality that the Army and the other services exercised was not done in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the air crew was of value. Everybody had a job. We didn't have people sitting around waiting for Omegas or something to come down the road. Everybody was employed. It was a different situation. You were a college graduate? No, I didn't finish college. Okay. I right. finished later when I was in the service. Is this a picture of you going when you first began the service? And that was when I was in recruiting service. I'd been in the service about two or three years then. So you're tra tell us about your training. Where were you trained? Where did they send you? And let me ask one other question first. Why did you pick the Air Force? I had a cousin in the Air Force, and, and I remembered my first flight in an airplane. I was five. It was on a barnstormer biplane, and, and there I was. And my father said, aviation is the coming thing. and I always thought he was right. And so it seemed that that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to sea or anything like that. I wanted to be in the Air Force. When the Korean War broke out, were you aware that we were going to war with Korea and uh, why no. we were going to war? Uh, I knew there were problems, but I, it took me about five days. I was in basic training to find out who we were at war with because we didn't have radios. There was no communication for us. We didn't know. Where did that uh, lead you then once? Because you Well, because they had to expand the basic training center rapidly mm -hmm. because the draft laws were in effect. Uh, they sent me to instructor school because I had some college background and I wound up teaching uh, in the medical field to basic trainees. Mm -hmm. And then I went to work on the flight line and I took care of the notifying the pilots for instrument school grading their tests, giving them their tests, uh, the, uh, registering their hours on Form 1, Form 5s that they needed to do for pay purposes. Mm -hmm. And they had all been flyers in the war, and they used to talk about it, mm -hmm. and they loved it, and I knew nothing about flying. 
So they put me in a link trainer and gave me a manual. And I did very well on my first flight, other than the fact it was 500 feet underground, but straight and level. <laughs> <laughs> and so they taught me and they, let, they took me up in T6s and let me practice a little bit about what they wanted me to know. It says here that uh, you talk about your OCS class. What does OCS stand for? The Officer Candidate School. Right. So you were a candidate for that. Yes. And uh, where did you receive your training for that? Well, I had to take a college equivalency test, which I did and passed it. And they sent me to uh, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. It was during peacetime. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't really have to care very much because they were in a reduction factor as personnel are concerned. So it was six months of torture, uh, three months as an underclass, and three months as an upper class. This is in 54 when you graduated, so the Korean War had de-escalated by yes, then. Yeah, it was coming to an end. Yeah, what, could, what was America's attitude toward the Korean War? Not good. Compared to World War II? Oh, not good. Mm. You know, in were fact, people we were thought, we were thought, it was interesting, because my brother it was four years younger, and his group, my group of people, left college when we, the Korean War started and bailed in into the services to serve because that's what the older generation had done, their older brothers and sisters. Four years later, was this, the social change was starting to happen in this country and you were thought you were a fool, couldn't get a job on the outside, so you had to go somewhere, so you went in the military. It was not a profession that was admired by many people. Mm. And most of the people that were like that were either disgruntled military people or people who knew nothing about it. Would you say that most of America was really not even aware of what we were doing in Korea or that attached oh, yes, to very that much war? So. That's yeah. the truth? Yes, yeah. yeah. so it got worse. We hear that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It got worse. Yeah, and, you let we, and yet we lost so many men there. But the, but the country was just not engaged in that. You know, it's war. very interesting because we, you know, in all the wars to, together, we lost more people at Gettysburg in one day than mm -hmm. we lost in the entire wars, mm -hmm. but the public doesn't seem to know that. Yeah. No, that's all history training, isn't it? You were the only WAIF in history, yes. in the history WAF. of the, Air, WAF of the, of the, of the uh, Air Force history. Well, I had four classmates what? that didn't show up. Oh. So <laughs> it was myself and about 120 guys. What was that like? Well, three of us had been tech sergeants because a lot of them were college graduates sitting around after basic training waiting for a class assignment. Uh, there were a few NCOs in the class and the three of us were the highest ranking ones. We were paid at, at our grade level. They were paid at staff sergeant level. And, uh, well, I had no place to hide, you know, during during the uh, lower class, and which is to see how well you follow. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody interviewed me. I, I, I had no depth to fall back in. Uh, what did your family think about your and your decision to? Uh, well, my parents were not military. A, uh, uh -huh. My mother was a very forward-looking person. Anything I wanted to do, she believed that you could do anything you want to do if you put your mind to it. In spite of the 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 problems in society of not wanting women to do this or do that. In 1956 you moved to um, Scott Air Force Base and yes. what what did you do there? Well the commanding general saw me on a Friday, he moved me at two o'clock in the afternoon from San Antonio and I had to be to work in, in St. Louis area on Monday at eight o'clock and take over a protocol for the training command. The training command was one of 17 commands in the Air Force at that time with 20 to 25 percent of the total personnel in it because we were doing foreign training, basic training, upgrade training, and any of the skill factors such as me mechanics, aircraft mechanics, or whatever. We did it all. And even the crew training, uh, people came back to us to be trained for crews for SAC or those sort of things. Uh, we flew more flying hours than any other command, but because we were also teaching pilots, navigators, and what, bombardiers, whatever was needed, that's what we did. We had 37 Air Force bases, three numbered Air Forces, and the headquarters, and the boss was on the road about 260 days of the year. You were really busy, weren't you? Very. I mean, it sounds like you're, you Very. I, you, I, you I had the Truman Four board. Point Plan, and the embassies were always visiting. Mm. The tech reps from North America or whoever were always visiting. We were flying uh, pol politicians around, Stevenson in Illinois, and of course uh, LBJ and people like that in Texas. Did you have opportunities to go home while you were serving 
Not know? much. Not much. I didn't have much time off yeah, because I didn't have, there wasn't another officer to take my place. And it was just busy. Mm -hmm. I was replaced by a major and two lieutenants, all academy graduates. One of them lived across the street from me in later years. He was a two star and he ran the security service. Mm. So. You eventually ended up in Europe. How did yes. that happen? Well, General uh, Myers, who was my boss at the training command, had a two digit serial number, is 37. I'd never seen that before, and I went to sign him out because I owned the information desk and the conference rooms. I thought I'd lost the number, went back upstairs, and they said, no, that is his number. And so uh, he told me that I had to work for him until he retired. And so I did, and mm -hmm. he didn't speak to me for two years. And then when he did, he, he wanted to know what I wanted, and I said, well, you know, I have a Foreign Service elective date of 1941 and eight years active service. I've been protected because I work for you. And they'll probably send me overseas. So I looked, was sent overseas to look at a job uh, in Paris with the Visitors Bureau. And I traveled as, a, as an administrative officer with the Ch Joint Chiefs of Staff. Rode around Europe with them and ran into General Dissesway, who was USAFE Advon. And he said, what are you doing here? And I, I told him I didn't understand the question. He said, I asked for you last week. I said, to do what? He said, to be protocol officer for USAFE. You want the job? I said, sure. So he said, go home, see your parents at Christmas, and be back the first of the year. What is USAFE? United States Air Forces in Europe, which is all of Europe. Oh, my gosh. And the protocol officer, that was the position? Yes, that was my job. And that means what? What was that? It sounds Well, that headquarters so was in charge of other numbered air forces. The 17th Air Force yeah, was in uh, let Libya. Get, let's uh, have you point some of these well, places out. Well, Libya is not there. It's right here. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in Germany. And we also had troops in England. We had them in Norway because we were part of NATO. And of course, in France, Spain, we had bombers in Spain, Morocco, Italy, Greece. I think that's pretty much, of course, Holland, Denmark, Belgium, all of those places. But and the, the protocol, Iron Curtain was very much in there at the time. The, and the, the fear of communism uh, overtaking the world, of, uh, was there a great fear of communism in the United States at that time? Prior to that, there was during the McCarthy time uh, mm -hmm. with communists. Uh, you know, we weren't too bothered by that sort of thing because we didn't deal with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, all we knew was that all of this area, in the green area here and so on, we weren't allowed to go into because they were all communist states controlled by Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union, there are two, there's different ideas in power. He who lives in the center controls the edge, or he who lives on the edge controls the center. It depends on how you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, they were operating from one point of view. We were operating from the opposite. What was your uh, What was your opinion of this, of uh, the the Russians at that point in the fifties? What was your thought about them? Uh, I didn't have much contact with them. Mm -hmm. I had more contact later with them. Um, mm -hmm. We, you know, the very f we just didn't get to talk to the average Russian. Was there a fear of a nuclear war? A fear of, because bomb shelters were being built in the United States and... Well, that was know. a little prior to that. That mm -hmm. was while I was still in high school because it was a result of dropping the bombs in Japan. Okay. The atomic thing was the thing that scared yeah. people. Yeah. You know, a lot of people said, yeah. well, today, well, you know, I've got this or that to deal with. I said, should have been around when they dropped the first bomb. Mm -hmm. We, it was frightening. We, so we, do you think later in the 50s that fear had started to dissipate or? Um, oh yeah, the security yeah. of, of uh -huh. uh, The building of our military. Well, it was another generation. You mm -hmm. see every every 20 yeah. years things mm -hmm. change. Uh, who was president during that time? Was it Eisenhower? No, he, he well he was president when I was in Germany. Mm -hmm. No. What was your that. opinion of him? Well, they think he was very popular, not only with the American public, but he was extremely popular with the Europeans mm -hmm. because they were familiar with him. And he was known to be quite fair. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to people that he had come to visit in, during the North African campaign, and he visited, and, and uh, the British were supporting us, and they just didn't have the food. And when he found out our air crews weren't eating, he ordered his aides to make sure that more supplies were sent in. They needed a higher protein diet. He saw to that. 
I mean, you know, we didn't have a lot of generals that had much experience when we got into the Second World War. They learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty young, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would you explain what your what you, what your job was as the protocol officer for all of Europe? What what did you do? I took care of, uh, my job was to take care of all the base commanders when they came in to visit, mm -hmm. and of taking care of uh, all VIPs, political or otherwise, uh, the tech reps from aviation companies or whoever, uh, any visitors to our, officially to our headquarters. Uh, one of the jobs, I mean, the, the British ran a, uh, a flight from London to to St. Louis it was a special flight, a speed flight. It was my job to go rescue the Brits in St. Louis and bring them over to our headquarters for a day and take them around and mm -hmm. you know, give them a chance to. They knew some of the American senior generals there, and of course I had uh, eight generals in my own headquarters that I took care of because they took turns being hosts to the various visitors. We put on all the dinners. We put on all the we, we notify the agencies responsible for briefings. We, if their fillings fell out, we replaced them because they were guests of the United States government. Mm -hmm. And our job was to make sure that everything went swimmingly well. And that's what we did. did. Was there a sense at all in the late 50s about a buildup of Vietnam? Or what was happening in Vietnam? Uh, in the military Vietnam life? Vietnam was very unpopular war. It, right, but in the in in, before, in the military pri prior to this 1960, when you were in the military, was there any talk? Well, we about knew we the knew that up? things were going down. Okay. We, we knew that intelligence-wise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, of course, you got sucked into that one. Yeah. Okay. And the military, we went because we were sent. Mm hmm Right. That was the thing. A lot of people were questioning it, but you don't question those things. This is a bureaucratic business. When the boss says move, you move. That's right. That's the military. Yeah. How did you meet your husband? Well, uh, General Spicer had been chief of staff at Air Training Command and worked directly for him for a while. He was a very famous fighter pilot. And uh, he took over the gunnery range at Lib in Libya. And when I was over in Europe with the JCS, he was up to Germany for the conference. And he asked, uh, the general in charge of our group, if he could borrow me for a few days and took me back to Libya with him. And then flew me to Madrid so I could join up with the rest of the group and we went through North Africa then. But, uh, you know, it's, it becomes quite a fraternity. And, and that I, everybody said, how, how come you work for him? I said, because he trusts me. I don't tell him what he wants to hear, I tell him what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I said, so he had been a very famous prisoner of war, and so he didn't take fools gladly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got him out, the Brits got him out, they found him underground. I handled the first German visit to, under the MAP plan to our training command. And the MAP plan is what? That was the military assistance program. Mm -hmm. And they came, and, and one of the officers was a colonel, and he was chief of intelligence, Luftwaffe. And there had been a change in hosts the night before. General Brandt was to take the, the visit, but he got called to Washington, so General Spicer got stuck with it. He didn't want to do it. And I said, well, sorry, but you're it. So while he was reading the biographies, I was entertaining the Germans, telling them what we were going to do and that things had changed. And they said, uh, which General Spicer is it? Because there were two in the Air Force by that name. And, and it was an intelligence officer. And I told him, I said, you know, you know very well which one it is. You're not chief of intelligence for nothing. And I said, secondly, you want, you want to know if does he like you? No, he doesn't. He hasn't forgotten. Mm -hmm. They said, we wouldn't have killed him. I said, you didn't have much choice. And he knows it, I know it, and you know it. And that's what war's all about. Mm. They must have thought you were a pretty unique woman. And in your clear thought, your clear thinking, your understanding, really, of what well, war was yeah. or is and what the military's responsibilities It uh, always boils down are. to the mission. It mm -hmm. always boils down for the reason to being there. I mean, mm -hmm. all this other stuff is gravy, you know? Mm -hmm. And we make it pleasant as we can, but it's not always nice. Mm -hmm. How did you meet um, Major Linwood Clark? Well, when I went to uh, North Africa with him, he said, do you know Captain Clark? And I said, nope, never heard of him. 
So Lynn had been asked the same thing if he knew me. Hmm. And so finally, uh, I had been dating two of Linwood's roommates. And so finally, uh, and when I was in Libya, uh, Glenn Karras, one of the roommates, was going to take me to lunch, and he worked for Linwood. He said, my boss is coming along. I said, okay. So when I answered the door, there stood Linwood, and I said, you must be Linwood Clark. And he said he was, and it kind of went from there. Mm -hmm. How old were you in this picture? This is just such a great picture of you. I was 23. 23, and where were you when this picture was taken? It was taken? my graduation from Officer Candidate School. Okay. Just a great picture. Didn't have a clue what was ahead of you there, did you? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had a, a tremendous career for 10 years, I tell you. You certainly did. And this picture was not too long after yeah, that? Yeah, that was at Training Command Headquarters when I was the protocol officer. You can see a little more serious in that picture, but yes. it was a serious business. Yeah. So pr this is before Europe? Yes. Before you went to Europe? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Europe job, European job was small job compared to that one. Really? Oh, yeah. And so you and, and uh, Linwood were married, and you stayed in Germany? Yes, he was stationed at Hahn. He'd moved from Libya up to Hahn. It was a fighter unit uh, up on the Eiffel, up high. It was an old German fighter thing. It was above the ground fog that they get in the winter, so they could scramble and intercept bombers coming over Germany from mm -hmm. England. And uh, he was stationed there. He was in and out of the headquarters a lot, because he did a lot of staff work. Mm -hmm. And so we saw each other a lot that way. Did you like living in Germany? Oh, I loved it. I mm -hmm. spoke German, so it worked out fine for me. Mm -hmm. And you adopted a child there. Yes, we adopted a little girl from Bavaria. Mm -hmm. And what's her name? Catherine. Catherine. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened then following your marriage, and then you had uh, also had a, a son, I believe. You had two children. Yes, well, Lynn asked me to leave the service because today they make an effort to put people together. In those days, it was called the dream sheet because it never came true, and there were no options. There were allowed 300 WAP officers, and we never were up to strength, never. Mm. And that, that would be just line officers, not nurses or, or JAGs. Who, who only allowed? That mm -hmm. many? Why, well, who only allowed? The Air Force only allowed? The Air allowed? Force quota for them on active duty really? would be maximum of 300. At one time? Yes. And uh, we never we never had that many. We all knew each other pretty much, mm -hmm. sooner or later. Mm -hmm. And so your husband asked you to, to leave the service? Yes, so that I, we could be together. Mm -hmm. And in the type of work he was in, the fighters were deployed here and there and everywhere much more so really than than SAC was. So they were, there was a real problem that d that occurred in the Air Force as a result of this. They, after 180 days, they discovered, they call it a change of station. Well, they let them be there for 177 days, could bring them back for three days and send them out again for another six months, and it was very hard on families. SAC was different because their mission was strategic and not, not tactical. The tactical people were always called in for little brush fires, Lebanon, uh, Panama, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. What was your rank at this point? I was a first lieutenant when I got out, but I was on the list for a promotion that year. I didn't stay to get it. Mm -hmm. In your uh, biography that you wrote here, um, that during the Cuban crisis, yes, it you, was were, you were asked to come back into the reserves. Yes. Could you tell us about that experience? Under the laws of the United States, I had to register with the draft. And I had 10 years, so eight years was their requirement. And I would be what they call Category 4R, and that means until the women and children in the trenches, the president doesn't call me back. And But I could volunteer to go back, and they were looking for personnel. So the personnel center asked me if I'd like to come back. And I ignored them because I knew I was Category 4R. There's no way they could bring me back. And then they found out I had children. And women were not allowed to have dependents under 18 under their roof. If I married a guy who was a widower or had kids, I was out the next day. It was a very, very unjust law. Why did they have that law, do you think? Why well, did they have a lot of them? I, one yeah. of my classmates, he was a physical therapist, and they wouldn't let him be one because he was a guy. And it was ridiculous. It was like, we have women pilots now that are very good, and you know, they're good because they're good. But there were rules about women this and men that. Mm. 
And so did you receive a letter asking you to leave the service? Uh, I received a letter telling me they were going to throw me out. And it was out of the personnel center in Denver. It was to be in October. And I wrote them and I said I would relieve my fellow officers for sitting on a board to rule on a law I believe to be unconstitutional and that I wanted that entered into the federal record. And it changed a few years later. It did? Yes. Did you we, keep... Did we you, were the generation that stood with our foot on both sides of the creek when the, cha when the changes occurred. Did you know it at the time that you had both feet Oh on yes. sides of the creek? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, we look back at some of the older officers that we inherited, affectionately called some of them the Biddy Brigade, because they they were little old ladies that ran girls' schools that the, they brought into the service during the Second World War, and by the time everything was over, they just sort of stayed on. Mm -hmm. And then there were others that were more forward-thinking, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, you all sound like the generation that followed uh, Jackie Cochran, for an example. Oh, I saw her. I knew her. Really? Yeah. She, was she as tough and strong? Well, as, she was, yeah, she was a she, symbol, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and uh, she would come and go, and, and she held the Reserve Commission and all of mm -hmm. this, but uh, mm. sure, we knew who they were. I, I knew a lot of women who had been wasps, and mm -hmm you know, uh, listen to some of their stories. And they were the women Air Force Service pilots, just for the record. Some of them, have, was, yeah. some of them were on active duty and they mm -hmm. wore pilot wings. We had been awarded them, but they weren't allowed to fly. And mm -hmm. uh, it was just insane, you know. And when the war ended, they no longer were allowed to fly. Well, it was fly. such a waste of manpower. That's, mm -hmm. this, that's, and they were becoming manpower conscious during the last few years I was enlisted. As a ground training sergeant, I was responsible for running that. and. The idea of man hours became exceptionally important in the business. Before mm -hmm. that, it, it just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So you retired. Well, you could call it that. But you <laughs> stayed in the military because your husband uh, yes. continued for how many more years were you in the military? Oh, gosh. You know, we got out and uh, he got out in 1983, mm -hmm. and I got out in 1960. So mm -hmm. he had told me, he said, oh, I'm just going to stay for 20 years. but." He liked what he did, mm -hmm. and he stayed for 34 years. And when he retired, you all were at Mountain Home Air Force Base? No, no we, where were he you? was the uh, commander of the Alaskan Air Command. He retired as a lieutenant yeah. general. Yeah. Well, you had quite the experience in the military, didn't you? I mean, from oh, the very yeah, beginning I, yourself yeah. and all the way up through then after your retirement, your, your husband's uh, career. And yeah. did you move around a lot? Yes, we moved. Uh, we had one assignment that was three years. All the rest of them were one or two. Mm. Mm -hmm. The Vietnam War, because Lynn was involved in that. Yes. Could you talk, tell us about that, what that was like as a military personnel and then again as an American citizen? Well, uh, it, all, all the rated people, the pilots, knew they were going. It was just a matter of when. And uh, my husband was sent over. He was sent to Washington, D.C. to school for a while, learning Vietnamese language and things like that. And then he was sent to survival camp, and then he was sent overseas, and he was gone for uh, altogether probably about a year and a half. As a military, um, a past military person and then a military wife, uh, were you supportive of, of uh, what we were doing in Vietnam, the purpose? Well, I understood what we were being, doing. You understood yes. it. Okay. That was an advantage for me. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the American, were, American didn't. public didn't have a clue. They weren't interested. Yeah. In fact, if anything, uh, they were abusive to mm -hmm. us when we came back. Uh, I didn't suffer much because uh, because of my military experience. You know, you couldn't tell me something I didn't know where to find the answer. Mm -hmm. And so I was never bothered much by it. I was able to cope very well with mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. I understood why my husband went. I knew what he did, and I knew why he did it. Mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons I married him. Mm -hmm. He was uh, committed and to mm -hmm. a belief that he felt strongly about, mm -hmm. and that is defending this country. What was it, one or two uh, of the most uh, memorable experiences for you serving in the military for those 10 years? Oh, it's hard to know. I think probably the greatest compliment I got was being replaced by three officers. And the last I heard, they'd been floundering a bit, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Uh, the general that had, he'd gone to Annapolis that lived across the street from me in, at Kelly Air Force Base, which is a large logistics center, 
came over and he said, I didn't know it was you. And I said, I know I changed my name. He said, how did you do it? I said, it was 24-7, that's how. I said, in all fairness, I didn't fly and I wasn't married with a family. And the three of you were, but there were three of you. And so mm -hmm. the base commander had been a student of mine, a colonel at OCS. It was a small world by then. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy your experience as a, as a military? I loved uh, it. I, had, I was very fortunate. Mm -hmm. I worked for great people. Mm -hmm. I met so many great people. Uh, uh, on, on the, Air for, the Air Training Command had an advisory board. Ed Link, who invented the Link trailer, trainer, was on that board. Mr. Fred Maytag from the Maytag Corporation was on that board. Mm -hmm. Gil Rob Wilson, the editor of Flying Magazine, was on that board, and we saw each other every 30 days mm -hmm. and uh, for several years. And your children traveled with you then throughout oh, yes. all their lives yes, after they did. you retired and, and uh, stayed in the military. So they were military kids. They sure were. Any, either one of them ever go into the military? My son went into the Army. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'd like for you to read something. You have such a sense of respect and awe of the World War II generation people. You saw them as a child. They were a huge impact on your life. You obviously served with a great number of them. I did. Um, and would you read what you wrote? Because I think it's it's just, it's so poignant, and I think that it is exactly how, how you feel. The people senior to me were mostly members of the greatest generation. Two I served with were survivors of the Corregidor March and several were prisoners of the Germans and the Japanese. Many of the flyers were still full of flack from the Palesti raids and things like that. Mm -hmm. They were the foundation cornerstones of today. They were forged during the Depression, when they had nothing, possessed with a responsible work ethic and a social conscience to contribute, serve, and sacrifice and save this country and others of the world. The life we enjoy and have today is because they were the ones who opened the social and creative floodgates to allow forward changes to be made. Women now are pilots. War experiences made realists out of them and personal self-serving sacrifice was not a problem for them but a challenge. They truly were the greatest generation and it was a very special privilege to work with them and to have known them. This nation should be grateful. It is one of the greatest civilizations in the history of the world. Mm. When Lynn retired, yes. what did you all decide to do? You've been in the military for so many years. <laughs> what was well, that like and what did you decide to do? The life expectancy of general officers is four years after retirement. Wow. Yes. And I saw them dropping like flies. They used to come by my office when they'd retire and kind of hang around. And they were lost mm -hmm. because this was, they were so committed, this was all they'd ever known. And uh, so I was determined that wasn't gonna happen to us. My husband grew up on a farm and of course he's one of these lucky people who has uh, great mental ability plus a, a can-do full speed ahead work ethic that goes with it. Keeping up with him is a full-time job because he just seems to think that everybody can do that. And I keep telling him that if you don't have the gray matter, there's not much you can do about it. <laughs> you know? But he feels that you, if you press on, that you can. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we bought the, the land in Eagle. I bought it. Why did you move to Idaho? Well, he had had the wing at Mountain Home and it was the F1, uh, F-111 wing of the F-111F, which was the Cadillac of that series with a bigger engine than they had in, in the others. Uh, the others are underpowered. And uh, Lynn had done the specifications. He and Jack Brown, one had Boeing and the other one had, had uh, General Dynamics and Jack lived with us and I, I baked chocolate chip cookies and sent them back and forth from Langley Air Force Base to Wright-Patterson research area, back and forth. And of course, eventually, and uh, it was interesting because one night, the two of them were building a uh, hydroplane in the garage. And my kids were babies and they were talking and I finally said, you know, 
I know that what you say engineering wise is correct about who's going to get the contract for that airplane. But I'm going to tell you something right now, it's going to go to so and so. And they said, that's ridiculous. I said, no, it isn't. And I said, politics was my business. And I said, they've got mm -hmm. each one. Uh, Washington has got two senators, Kansas has got two senators, Texas has got two senators, and Texas has Lyndon Johnson tell me it's going to go there. It did. And it did. Yeah. You could have picked him up with the tweezers. I said, well, you guys aren't into staff level thinking right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned that. I, I think my first ER was, doesn't understand staff level thinking. They're right. I'd never seen such a collection under one roof. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't so, idealistic, that's for sure. So you bought a, a little ranch in Eagle, I We did, mm -hmm. and uh, we ran mm -hmm. cattle and had horses, and I showed dogs. I was mm -hmm. the top breeder for several years of Shetland sheepdogs mm -hmm. in Idaho. Mm -hmm. We made several champions, and then I promised my husband I would retire the hounds at 65, and I did. Mm -hmm. You've had quite a life, Joan. I mean, it's pretty yes. incredible when you look at the very first picture of you at 19 years old and graduating and not a clue where your life was taking you. No, not a clue. I, I had no idea that you it know. would open these doors, but it mm -hmm. did. A question I'd like to ask you before we end our interview. In all the years, the 10 years that you stayed in the U.S. Air Force as a military person, was so active and saw so much of the world and learned so much, you have grandchildren, is that correct? Yes. All right. If there, if there's any kind of a lesson or a message that you could leave them when they see this film about uh, how your military experience helped create you to become the woman you are today, what did you learn, what did you carry with you and still hold true today? I think the thing that it taught me was realism. To tell the difference between idealistic goals and realistic achievements. You can always have idealistic goals, you should have them. But you live in a world, and the world is real, and you have to deal with that. And you can't look at it as a failure, it's just part of the trip mm -hmm. toward that goal. And you probably will never achieve that top goal in this world, but you have to aim for something. And they taught me that. If failure was something you learned to live with and accept as being part of life. That's a pretty strong message. I hope they'll carry that with them forever. They've got quite a grandmother. I hope they will too. I can't thank you enough for coming to this museum and allowing us. It's, it's just been such an honor, Joan, to spend thank this you. time with you and preserve your history on no, film. No, I've been very fortunate. I've had a great life, and I know that. Well, you're also a great American, and we are so appreciative of everything you did, giving 10 years of your life and then 20, at least 20 more with your husband in the service of our country, because you're right, this is the greatest country in the world, and it is so because of people like you who are willing to um, thank help you. it move along in the right direction. So I didn't think so I lived to see the American public glad to see us, mm. but it's happened. It's happened. Thank you. When I went, first went to work in operations and logging the pilots' time and hours and sending them off to instrument school and for their physicals for their birthday and issuing the tests and that sort of thing, uh, I noticed that they always had such a good time, the instructor pilots, when they came in at noon or at, at the end of the day talking about who they were flying with and what happened. And I didn't understand anything they were saying. So I told them, I, I said, I need to know this. So they gave me a manual on the theory of flight starting about with Icarus flying too close to the sun. And then they started teaching me about the link trainer. And this is the link. And they put me in the link trainer. And like I said that my first flight was successful, straight and even, but 500 feet underground. What was it like when they put that hood, closed it up, and it was yeah. dark, and the, just the... Well, they're on a desk, yeah, the causing desk. hazardous things to happen right. to you. <laughs> right, right. And uh, I used to hear the uh, IPs talk, the instructor pilots, about the, how they knew who was operating the desk, because my new boss was a guy named Jackson, Captain Jackson, and he had been the chief instrument pilot for Eastern Airlines, the reservists brought on during the Korean War, and he was a holy terror on the link. <laughs> According to the IPs, everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. 
and, and so uh, then they took me up in T6s and let me practice turning and flying. And Had the link trainer helped prepare you for that at all? Yes, because I had no concept. I found out that a real airplane was easier to fly than that link. Mm -hmm. Link is so much more sensitive. Mm -hmm. yeah.